Good afternoon, bon après midi. Welcome to this special edition of the Physical Society Colloquium organized jointly with the McGill Graduate Association of Physics Students and GAPS. I'm coming to you live from the brutalist majesty of the Rutherford Physics Building at McGill University in beautiful downtown Montreal, where the high bandwidth connection is as free as a Gaussian field theory. If you are in the Zoom session and you prefer not to be recorded or live streamed, please log out of Zoom and join us via YouTube. This afternoon, we will have a 45 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. To ask a question in Zoom, please use the raise hand feature following the talk. To ask your question in YouTube, please enter it into the chat. The questions will be relayed to me by my sidekick following the talk, and I'll pass them on to the speaker. After the Q&A session, the live stream and recording will stop. Professors uh, will be asked to log out of the Zoom session, and undergrads, grads, and postdocs, as well as other non-faculty in the Zoom session, will be invited to the après colloque, a chance to get to know the speaker in a more intimate setting. With that, I will now pass to Ben Dringoli, president of MGAPS, to introduce the speaker. Ben. All right. Hi, everyone, and thanks for coming out to the MGAPS colloquium this year. My name is Ben Dringoli, current president of uh, MGAPS. Before I introduce our speaker, who we're all extremely excited to hear from, I want to briefly go over MGAPS uh, for those of you who might be new to the department or to these talks. MGAPS is the McGill Graduate Association for Physics Students, the student organization for the physics grads here at McGill. Uh, we cover a wide range of responsibilities within the department, from academic and advisor support, to TA training and union matters, to social events that bring the grads together out of our offices and our labs. In addition to this yearly colloquium that I'm so glad you all came out to attend. For any grads listening, if you ever have a question about department procedure or an idea for a fun event, you can reach out to me or the appropriate officer. Uh, we're here for you. But enough about us, we're here for a talk which has been voted upon by the MGAPS members. Our guest this year is none other than Dr. Sean Carroll. I'm sure that many of us know Dr. Carroll through his books, his television appearances, or his extensive uh, catalog of past scientific talks, regardless of which I'm sure he'll blow us away today. Uh, as a bit of background, Sean got his start at Villanova University and moved on to the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics for his grad work. Following postdocs at both MIT and UC Santa Barbara, Dr. Carroll became a faculty member at the University of Chicago until 2006, where he transferred to his current position at the California Institute of Technology. Much of Dr. Carroll's career has been spent asking big questions about our universe, from cosmology and gravitation, to dark matter and dark energy, all the way to the extra dimensions, fundamental symmetry violations, and the like. Recently, he seems to be incorporating even more philosophy into his work, asking questions about the fundamental natures of physical principles of things such as probability, space-time, and entropy. His passion for asking deep questions about the world we live in have been an inspiration for many, including myself, as I distinctly remember him melting my brain as a science-obsessed teenager in some of the media uh, appearances he's made in the past. I'm just excited to see what he has in store for us today. With that, please help me give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Carroll, who will be here to talk to us about uh, from quantum mechanics to space-time and seemingly everything in between. Dr. Carroll. Thanks very much, Ben. Thanks, everyone. Uh... It's an enormous pleasure, of course, to visit McGill, even if only virtually. I visited McGill in actual life before, and I miss the food that I would have gotten there in Montreal had I actually been there, but you know, we adapt to our circumstances. So today I wanna to talk about quantum gravity. Quantum gravity uh, is something that we have thought about for a long time. There has been progress, but not enough progress. So the specific angle that I want to take is that we should be able to imagine making progress in quantum gravity by first trying to better understand quantum mechanics. So in fact, much of the talk is going to vaguely resemble undergraduate quantum mechanics lectures, you know, maybe the part in your undergrad quantum course that you didn't get taught but should have, uh, but it will lead in hopefully to great things. And so I'm not advocating string theory or loop quantum gravity or any particular model like that, but hopefully what I have to say will be of use to anyone who is interested in those spe specific ways of thinking about uh, the approaching quantum gravity. So the, here's the one slide summary of what I wanna say. We have a way of thinking about quantum theories. When you develop a quantum theory, when you're a physicist and you wanna invent a quantum theory of something or another, all the way back to when you were a student, what you do is you write down the classical theory. 
That is to say, you write down a Hamiltonian or a Lagrangian or an action or some equations of motion or whatever. And then we have some rules for quantizing the classical theory. And then we invent a quantum theory from that. But presumably nature doesn't work that way. Nature doesn't start with a classical theory and then quantize it. Nature just is quantum. So the more fundamental move is to go from a quantum theory to a classical description, to the classical limit in some sense. Now, I know that you think that you've been told how to do this. There are things called Ehrenfest's theorem and coherent states. There's known techniques for getting the classical limit of a quantum theory. I think that those are good but missing some aspects, especially when it comes to deep questions like quantum gravity. I think they're cheating just a little bit. I will use the word cheating over and over again in this talk because I think a lot of, a lot of people uh, just think they, they know the answer, so they skip to what the right answer is. And in particular, when it comes to gravity, we're faced with a very specific problem in that we haven't been able to take our classical theories of gravity, quantize them, and get a perfectly satisfactory answer. Uh, the task is made more difficult by the fact that quantum field theory is our favorite way to describe everything in the world other than gravity. But there's very good reason from holography and complementarity and things like that to think that gravity is not a conventional quantum field theory. So the approach I want to take can be summarized by saying that instead of quantizing gravity, whether it's string theory or loop quantum gravity or general relativity or whatever, maybe we should be looking for gravity within quantum mechanics. Maybe we should be taking the quantum nature of the theory more seriously. And that might involve understanding a little bit the foundations of quantum mechanics, as terrible as that sounds. I don't think it really is as terrible as, as our undergraduate courses made it out to be. So to say that again with slightly more details, here's what you do as an undergrad. You're given, for example, the simple harmonic oscillator or a particle moving in a one-dimensional potential. And you're told that there's a classical theory that is given by Hamiltonian mechanics. Very often, if you're like me, you'd never heard of Hamiltonian mechanics before you took quantum mechanics, but you could have in principle, if things had developed logically, you would have been told that classical mechanics, even those invented by Newton, there's another way of doing it that was invented by Hamilton, which says that there are, there's a, something called phase space, and phase space is the space of states of your classical theory. And space, phase space is coordinatized by, by coordinates, uh, positions, configurations, and momenta, so x and p. Then there is a function of the coordinates and the momenta, the Hamiltonian function, and the Hamiltonian function tells you how you evolve in phase space. So for example, here is the Hamiltonian that we might typically be taught for a one dimensional particle moving into potential. And then we're told, let's turn this into a quantum mechanical theory. So instead of the states being points in phase space, we will invent something called the wave function, which is a complex valued function of half of phase space. So it can be a complex valued function of position or of momentum or some more subtle combination of the two. And it satisfies various conditions. So it's a map from position, let us say, to the complex numbers. It is normalizable in this particular way. It's square integrable is what we say. So the integral of psi star psi is a finite number. And it obeys this equation, not Hamilton's equation, but the Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation, like Hamilton's equations, makes use of something called the Hamiltonian. And there is a, but the Hamiltonian is a different thing in quantum mechanics. In classical mechanics, it's a function on phase space. In quantum mechanics, it is an operator that changes your wave function into something else. And so what you need to do is have a procedure for taking this classical looking function and turning it into an operator. And so we have such a procedure. You put hats on all the X's, you put hats on all the P's and you write P as a derivative with respect to X. And there you go. Now the Hamiltonian that you had for the classical theory also works as the Hamiltonian for the quantum theory. And there you go, that's your quantum theory. Wave functions, Hamiltonian, Schrodinger's equation, et cetera. Now, if you think about it and you're mathematically inclined, if you're John von Neumann, for example, you realize that this thing that we call the wave function that we defined satisfies a set of mathematical axioms. We can add wave functions together. That's the superposition principle. We can scale them by complex numbers. So wave functions form a vector space. And we also need a norm. We need to be able to multiply and take the dot product or the inner product between wave functions. 
That's shown here in Dirac's famous bra ket notation. So psi and, and phi are two different wave functions. We inner product them together to get a complex number. This just says that the set of all wave functions is a vector space. And we call that vector space Hilbert space, OK? So just like we can talk about the mathematical structure of phase space, it's a symplectic manifold and things like that, we can talk about the mathematical structure of Hilbert space, the space of all quantum states. It's a vector space. And this is sort of a good news, bad news situation. Vector spaces are about the simplest mathematical spaces we can think of. So on the one hand, they're easy to use. But on the other hand, you might worry that we've lost a little bit of ability to define different spaces in which our theories live. All d-dimensional Hilbert spaces are the same. They're just vector spaces. But let's just keep that in mind for uh, going down the road. As of this slide, what we would say is if someone asked us, what do you mean by a quantum theory? What are the ingredients that specify a quantum theory? In classical mechanics, the ingredients were phase space and a Hamiltonian. In quantum mechanics, the ingredients are Hilbert space, which just amounts to telling us the dimensionality of Hilbert space, right? That's, the, that's a reflection of the simplicity of vector spaces. If someone told you that you were doing you know, classical gauge theory and your field was defined in some fiber bundle, there's an enormous amount of structure involved there. Like what are the fields, what are the projections and so forth? What are the symmetries? But in Hilbert space, there's nothing. It's just a vector space with D dimensions. Once you tell me D, you've told me what Hilbert space we're in. The other thing you tell me is what the Hamiltonian is. The Hamiltonian is an operator on Hilbert space and it pushes forward the wave function in time. It powers the Schrodinger equation. So that's it. That's all you need to tell me when you define a quantum mechanical theory. Now I should pause here because there's a technicality. I don't wanna give you a technicality right out of the gate so early in the talk, but it's very, very important because if I tell you that a quantum theory is fully defined by the dimensionality of Hilbert space and the Hamiltonian, Many people are going to say, well, what about the observables of the theory? Many attitudes towards quantum mechanics start with the set of observables. So why didn't I mention observables? And so let me explain what this technicality is. When you're taught about observables in quantum mechanics as an undergrad, you're taught that observables are Hermitian operators, right? O dagger equals O. That's a Hermitian operator. If you go slightly more into the details and you know that you're going to be working sometimes in infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, then what you really want are self-adjoint operators. This is the condition that an operator be self-adjoint. It reduces to being Hermitian in the finite dimensional case, but it's a more general idea. And in general, operators can be specified by giving an algebra. There's a way of multiplying operators together by taking their commutator and you get another operator of some sort. So there's a basis for operators here that tells you exactly what the uh, set of all the operators that could be observables are. Okay, so why am I telling you this? Do you need to tell me the set of observables in order to specify what your quantum theory is? Well, the answer is it depends. And it depends on the dimensionality of Hilbert space. If Hilbert space is finite dimensional, you only need to tell me that dimension. The set of all self-adjoint operators is just the set of all Hermitian operators, which is perfectly well-defined. As soon as you tell me the dimensionality of Hilbert space, you're done. We know what all the observables are, okay? Whereas in infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, things are much more subtle. In infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, different sets of observables can define different quantum mechanical theories. So if, your quantum theory has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, then you need to tell me what the algebra of observables is in order to define it. Therefore, we need to start off the whole process by asking, should we care about finite dimensional or infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces? And if you remember from your undergraduate quantum course, uh, Hilbert spaces are very, very often infinite dimensional. You don't need to work very hard to find an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. The simple harmonic oscillator or just about any other non-relativistic particle in a one-dimensional potential has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, right? And we know that because one way of, of seeing it is to think about the energy eigenstates. We know that energy eigenstates span the entire Hilbert space. So you just ask how many energy eigenstates are there? Well, for the harmonic oscillator, there's a ground state first excited state, a second excited state, and all the way up to infinity. There's an infinite number of energy levels in the harmonic oscillator. So we know that the harmonic oscillator has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And maybe by now you're thinking, well, okay, Hilbert space is always going to be infinite dimensional. 
And you can also get that impression by thinking about quantum field theory, right? The world is not a simple harmonic oscillator, but in quantum field theory to a good approximation, we can model the world as a collection of many, many, many harmonic oscillators. And it's important for those of you who haven't taken quantum field theory yet, the point here is not that at every point in space, there is a simple harmonic oscillator. A quantum field theory says there are fields like the electric field, the uh, magnetic field, but also the particles that we know about, the electrons, the quarks, they're all fields filling all of space, okay? And it's not that every one of them at every point acts like an oscillator. It's what we do is take the Fourier transform. So we think about plane waves with fixed wavelengths and every plane wave mode in the simplest approximation where the fields don't interact with each other, every plane wave mode acts like a harmonic oscillator, okay? So there are automatically an infinite number of possible states in a quantum field theory at every wavelength. So the fact that the dimensionality of Hilbert space in quantum field theory is infinite has nothing to do with the fact that space is infinite. It has nothing to do with the fact that there is a, you can go down to zero wavelength. So if you put a cutoff on small wavelengths or a cutoff on large wavelengths, what we'd call a UV cutoff and an, ultra, and an infrared cutoff, ultraviolet and, and infrared, still you have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space because still every single mode can be described by an infinite number of things going on. Every mode can have an arbitrary amount of energy. So it is crystal clear that quantum field theory as we understand it has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space involved and quantum field theory is hugely successful. So you might be thinking, well, there we go. We know the answer. The Hilbert space of the real world is infinite dimensional. But there is a subtlety because I already hinted at the fact that gravity is not perfectly well-defined by a quantum field theory, described by a quantum field theory. Gravity turns out changes everything. Remember, the reason why in quantum field theory there's an infinite dimensional Hilbert space is because in any one region, I can take a mode of a certain wavelength and I can excite that mode an arbitrary number of times, an infinite number of times, putting more and more energy into that region of space. But gravity comes along and says, actually something happens when you try to do that. When you try to take a mode of a quantum field theory fixed in a region of space and make it more and more energetic, gravity says it will eventually collapse into a black hole. So if you take a region of size L, whatever size that is going to be, and say, how many different things can I do in this region, okay? You can excite the modes. You can get every mode of your quantum field theory more and more energetic, but eventually it makes a black hole and then you can't excite it anymore. If you try to add more energy, you make the black hole bigger than the region that you started with. So if the question you're asking is, how many things can I do in a region of fixed size in a theory with gravity? The answer is finite. There's only a finite number of states that you need to describe that. And that means that the dimensionality of Hilbert space corresponding to any one region is a finite number. That's a big difference between gravity and quantum field theory. It's already a hint before we know anything about string theory or anything else, black hole information loss or anything like that, we already have a hint that a conventional quantum field theory will not be up to the task of quantizing gravity. We even know what the dimensionality of Hilbert space is. We, we have a rough idea. Now this is more speculative, but I think it's, uh, it's pretty well, it's pretty likely to be on the right track. Beckenstein and Hawking back in the 70s told us that black holes have entropy, right? The entropy of a black hole is given by the area of its event horizon measured in Planck units. Now by itself, that's not that surprising. Lots of quantum theories have area laws for entropy, even in their ground states. Forget about black holes, just a ground state of a quantum field theory often has an area law for entropy. What's important is that the black hole is supposed to be the maximum entropy state that you can put into that region, okay? That means it's telling us something about the dimensionality of Hilbert space. The entropy in quantum mechanics tells us about the amount of entanglement between one subsystem, in this case, the black hole, and the rest of the world. And if there's a maximum amount of entanglement you can have, that implies a maximum amount of Hilbert space that that system can, needs to be described by. So what you have is the dimensionality of Hilbert space, if you know what a maximum entropy state has an entropy of, is e to that entropy. E, I should put this should be S max here. The specific maximum amount of entropy you could have for a system is the logarithm of the dimensionality of Hilbert space. So we know what that is for regions of space in theories with gravity. It's E to the Planck area squared, E to the area of the region of the boundary of the region squared in Planck units. So we know that, for example, for one cubic centimeter, 
The dimensionality of Hilbert space needed to describe what's going on is big. It's e to the 10 to the 66, but it's finite. There is a difference. There will be very important mathematical differences between infinite numbers and really, really big numbers. One important mathematical difference is you don't need to tell me what the observables are the theory are. I know what they are. I know what all the Hermitian operators are that act on that finite dimensional Hilbert space. And just to be super duper clear here, I'm not saying that the dimensionality of Hilbert space for a black hole is e to the 10 to the 66. I'm saying we can use black holes to derive the fact that the total dimensionality for Hilbert space for anything that can happen in a one cubic centimeter of empty space, of, of space, empty or not, is this large but finite number, okay? So that means that when we do our little project of going from a quantum theory to a classical theory, we have very little to work with, right? I give you the dimensionality of Hilbert space, and then I know that the state of the universe, the wave function, is a vector here. Now I've switched to you know, Dirac's notation. So this is a little ket. I did have h acting on psi of x when we were talking about wave functions. But this is no longer necessarily a wave function as a function of space. This is a vector in a Hilbert space, a vector in an abstract vector space evolving according to this Schrodinger equation. Okay, So that's all you need to tell me to define the quantum theory. And so the question is, how do we get from there to the classical theory? How can we be given so little information as just the Hamiltonian of a quantum theory in the dimensionality of Hilbert space and, go, and look at it and go, oh yes, that is QCD, or that's a simple harmonic oscillator, right? QCD and a simple harmonic oscillator had the same dimension in Hilbert space. Um, we're looking at finite dimensional ones, but still reverse engineering what they actually look like is a tricky problem. Almost always, the, quest, the answer to this question is begged rather than answered. We assume we know what the physical stuff is that we're talking about. If someone gives you two electrons and they, they say, what is the physical system being described? Well, you say, well, it's two electrons. I know what that is. Yeah, I don't need to work very hard. But here we're imagining no one has told you that. All they've told you is here's Hilbert space, here's a Hamiltonian. No words like space, particles, fields, forces, none of those words are allowed. Those are all supposed to be derived from fundamentally quantum words like Hamiltonian vectors, tensor products, entanglement, stuff like that. That is a harder problem than it looks like because we think we already know the answer because we grow up in a kind of classical world, but gravity is making that answer harder to find than we would like. Now you may think, that it's not that hard because when we're given a Hamiltonian, we can kind of look at the Hamiltonian and suss out what it's describing, right? Just from the form of what the Hamiltonian is. Here's a Hamiltonian. This is, if, you, if you've taken the class and it wasn't too long ago in your academic career, you look at that Hamiltonian, you instantly say, ah, oh, yes, that is a simple harmonic oscillator, right? This is P squared here and that's omega squared, X squared. There you go, it's a, it's a harmonic oscillator. But that's cheating. Like I said, we're going to be cheating a lot, or I'm going to be uncovering cheating uh, very often in this talk. It's cheating because I've given you the Hamiltonian in a very specific basis for Hilbert space, namely the position basis. There's an operator x hat. There are eigenstates of x, right? x hat acting on x is x times x. This is my favorite equation in all quantum mechanics. And that's the basis for Hilbert space in terms of which we've written this Hamiltonian. But I didn't, when I gave you the ingredients for defining a quantum theory, I didn't mention any preferred basis to use. I mean, we know this isn't the only basis you could use. You could define the harmonic oscillator in the momentum basis or the, you know, the raising and lowering operator basis. Who told you to do it in that basis? The question we're, we should be addressing is if you're given the Hamiltonian in any basis, can you figure out what is going on? Well, there's only one basis that is actually picked out by the structure of the quantum theory itself. And that's the energy eigenbasis. Because the one operator you're given, you're not given x as anything very special, but you're given h. You're given the Hamiltonian, right? So the Hamiltonian does define a basis in Hilbert space, the energy eigenbasis. And the information that is contained in that uh, specification of basis is what we call the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. The spectrum is just the list of all the energy eigenvalues, OK? So when I say someone gives you a dimensionality of Hilbert space and someone gives you a Hamiltonian, what I mean is someone gives you the list of energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. It's your job to figure out what is being described by this Hamiltonian. 
that's hard. That's going to be a very, very difficult thing to do. How do we do that? Well, let's take the examples where we think we know the answer and then try to suss out what was going on. So position basis, for example, who, who told us that it was a sensible thing to write the simple harmonic oscillator in that basis? The answer is that even though we talk about the harmonic oscillator or other simple physical systems in isolation, in the real world, we look at them. In the real world, we're, they're not in isolation. They're embedded in an environment with observers and things like that. The reason why position, the location of the actual oscillators makes sense to us as a basis to use is because it is what we see when we look at the oscillator. If you have two objects on a spring, you see them and you see where they are, okay? So that is not just a statement about the system. That is a statement about our relationship to the system, which is defined by the interaction of the system. So the crucial step in going from a, an austere list of energy eigenvalues to a complex multi-featured description of reality is dividing up Hilbert space into subsystems and seeing how they interact. So we're gonna to try to ask how to do that in what is a useful way. And the word useful will mean different things under different circumstances. So let me rush through this a little bit because uh, I, was, I just realized it's a 45 minute talk and I prepared an hour talk. So I'm gonna to have to zip through some things. Uh, this is the little technical thing that you might have been introduced to in your intro quantum class, but it might have gone by very quickly. What do you mean when you say you divide Hilbert space up into subsystems? So you could say, well, it's a vector space. You can take a direct sum, right? You can take two vector spaces and add them together. And that's true, you can do that, but that's not what we mean in quantum mechanics, generally when we talk about subsystems. A direct sum means one thing is happening, V1, vector space one, or V2 is happening, or maybe some combination of both, but they're perpendicular to each other. What we really mean are tensor products, which are a little bit more subtle, but a tensor product in, in uh, abstract algebra is a way of talking about two things happening simultaneously. So there's something going on in vector space V1 and something going on in vector space V2. And so the dimensionality of the tensor product space is the product of the dimensionalities of the two subspaces. And you can sort of think of it as one big vector in this way. The reason why I'm mentioning this is the task before us, this what we call quantum muriology, breaking the whole into parts, is one of starting with one big Hilbert space and asking how best to factorize it into things that we will tensor product together to make the system as a whole. And there's a huge amount of freedom in doing that. Again, if someone hands you two electrons, you don't think twice, you just take the tensor product of the two electron Hilbert spaces. But we're trying to go backwards. If someone gives you Hilbert space, how do you know it describes two electrons? So let's imagine you have two qubits. For those of you who aren't familiar, quantum bits, spins that uh, might have two states like spin up and spin down. So here's the spin of one particle, the spin of another particle. Each of them is two dimensional. The tensor product is a four dimensional Hilbert space. And this is a very natural basis to use. But look, I can define another basis. I can define a qubit alpha and another qubit beta such that when I multiply them together, I get these weird entangled superpositions of system one and system two. So roughly, schematically, system one and system two are one way of factorizing Hilbert space. System alpha and system beta is a different way of factorizing Hilbert space, and they're related by a unitary transformation. And there are an infinite number of different ways to factorize Hilbert space. How do we pick the right one? Well, the answer has to be, we get information from the Hamiltonian. That's all the information we have. The Hamiltonian needs to tell us everything because it's all we got, okay? So the Hamiltonian is a map. It's an operator on Hilbert space. You give me a vector, Hamiltonian acts on it. It spits out another vector. But once I divide Hilbert space into subsystems, once I take Hilbert space and describe it as the tensor product of A and B, then the Hamiltonian also decomposes. It turns into a term that acts only on A, the self-Hamiltonian for subsystem A, a term that only acts on B, the self-Hamiltonian for B, and an interaction between the two of them, okay? And this is more or less unique. There's some little details in here, but again, we have now the beginnings of structure in the Hamiltonian coming from a different way of looking at Hilbert space, dividing up into these factors. So we can ask, what is the best way of making this tensor product factorization of the Hamiltonian, sorry, of Hilbert space, so that the Hamiltonian looks like something that we're familiar with? And then there'll be a three-step process in doing this. 
Step one is how do we recover classical behavior? Okay, again, the classical limit, something you've been taught in undergrad quantum, but it's a little more subtle than what you were taught. What you were taught was if you have a wave function and it's localized into a wave packet and it can more or less evolve according to the classical equations of motion, a la Ehrenfest's theorem, that's what you mean by classical behavior. A little electron will spread out all over the place. A big heavy thing like the earth will remain more or less localized on its classical trajectory. And that is true. That is part of classical behavior, but it's not the only part. There's a whole other thing going on with classical behavior. Think of Schrodinger's cat. I'm sure you've all heard of it. I like to do Schrodinger's cat, imagining that the two states of the cat are awake and asleep because I'm a cat person. Schrodinger was not a cat person, so he had a live cat and dead cat. But you can change the state of the cat with sleeping gas just as easily as with cyanide gas. So imagine that you have a cat and you can imagine a state of it awake and a state of sleep. In the quantum formalism, there's nothing holding you back from writing down a state, which are, these are actually called cat states in the literature, one over square root of two, the cat is awake, plus one over the square root of two, the cat is asleep. The question is, why don't we ever see states like that in the macroscopic world? And the answer we know, it's called decoherence. Imagine that a photon in the box where Schrodinger's cat is, is flying by in such a way that it would be absorbed if the cat were awake, but it would pass right on by if the cat were asleep. What that means is that Again, in quantum mechanics, you can't ignore interactions with the rest of the world. There is stuff inside the box other than the cat. There are photons, there are air molecules. We group these together, we call them the environment. And the environment interacts with the cat, like it or not, okay? And that branches the wave function of the universe into one where the cat is either awake or the cat is asleep, okay? So the cat becomes entangled with its environment very quickly if it's in this highly, highly non-classical looking state. But once the wave function collapses or you're on a branch or however you wanna say it, once the cat is either just awake or just asleep, it doesn't keep getting entangled with the environment. It became entangled enough and then it's fairly robust to being monitored by the environment because all the photons hit it and interact with it in the same way. It doesn't keep becoming entangled to Avogadro's number of entanglements just because there's a lot of atoms in the cat. That's a feature of classical systems. They don't become entangled very much with their environment. So there's actually two features of classical systems. One is that localized states remain localized, and the other is that unentangled states remain unentangled, okay? At least robust ma macroscopic classical looking states. So it turns out this is very, very nice. And this is a question that Ashmeet Singh and I have recently been addressing, something that could have been addressed in the 1950s, but no one ever did because people had other things to worry about. Um, how do you know how to div divide Hilbert space into this decomposition system and environment so as to get classical behavior? Well, like we said, this factorization gives you a decomposition of the Hamiltonian into system part, environment part, and interaction part. We now have two criteria that we want to fit, localization and lack of entanglement. And guess what? The system Hamiltonian governs whether or not the system remains localized and the interaction Hamiltonian governs whether or not it remains unentangled. So what we want to do is sift through all of the possible factorizations of Hilbert space to find the one that best matches both of these criteria simultaneously. So we define a, a quantity that we call the Schwinger entropy, which characterizes how much it remains localized and remains unentangled. And you look through all the different possible factorizations of Hilbert space to find the one in which that entropy is minimized. And we, we argue that it works. So here's a little numerical example. We looked at two harmonic oscillators. So the red ball is an oscillator, the blue ball is an oscillator, and then they slightly interact with each other. Okay, so this is, ahead of time, what we're guessing is the sensible quasi-classical factorization. And then we forget it. We sort, of, we sort of randomly change the factorization and move it away from the quasi-classical factorization. And we calculate this quantity, the Schwinger entropy, and we find that it always increases when you go away from the quasi-classical factorization. In other words, we claim that we have an algorithm. If you give me Hilbert space and the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, I can figure out the best way to factorize that Hamiltonian so that it looks classical. The demand of classicality tells us how to give some structure 
to this otherwise very bare and austere Hamiltonian. And thinking about these things uh, in this way sort of shed some light on ancient questions. Here's an ancient question, ancient for me anyway. If we go back to Hamiltonian mechanics in the classical world, right? We're told that there's Q and P positions and momenta and H is a function of Q and P and you can find Hamilton's equations. But interestingly, there's no real deep difference between Q and P, right? There's nothing in the structure of Hamiltonian mechanics itself that puts position and momentum on a different footing from each other. You can have any arbitrary function of Q and P. But in the real world, there's obviously a huge difference between positions and momentum. We live in position space, right? We locate things in position space, whereas momentum space is kind of complicated. And that's a reflection of the fact that interactions are local in position space in the real world. So what Ashmead and I found is that that fact that position and momentum are treated very differently is a natural outcome of this demand for getting the classical limit of a quantum theory. When you ask that the interactions between the environment and the system uh, put the system into a state and don't keep entangling it, that implies the existence of a coordinate Q, which we call the pointer observable, and there is a conjugate variable to P. Uh, and then you ask, well, what is the condition that Q not spread out very much? That condition is that the Hamiltonian looks like this, that it looks like p squared plus a function of q. In other words, there's no p to the fourth, there's no p squared, q squared terms or anything like that. This very familiar form of the Hamiltonian might be true because it is Hamiltonians like that that can be the classical limits of quantum mechanical theories. Uh, we think that's a really cool thing. We're thinking about that. Um, but, but there's more thoughts to, that going into that before we can actually say it uh, for sure. Okay, that was step one, getting the classical limit. Step two is, what about space, right? When I talk about Schrodinger's cat, we have basically two state systems, the cat's awake or the cat's asleep. We want to be much richer in what we're describing. We want to eventually get to quantum field theory in a curved space-time background, right? So we need three-dimensional space and we need local interactions in three-dimensional space. That's the hallmark of a quantum field theory is that the, the two hallmarks are relativity and locality, local interactions in space. So electron wave functions only interact when they're literally at the same location in space. And we know from quantum field theory that if this is a picture of space, okay, we can divide space into little subregions and we can associate with each subregion a factor of Hilbert space. So I didn't label this very uh, explicitly, but on the right here, we have space. On the left here, we have a factorization of Hilbert space, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, okay? This is not any necessary correspondence. This is something we know ex post facto about quantum field theory. In fact, there's even footnotes and, and caveats here if you're in gauge theories, but let's ignore those for now. It seems to be a feature of local quantum field theory that we can divide up Hilbert space into what is going on in individual regions of space. And that again, that's a decomposition of the Hamiltonian, of, of the Hilbert space, which implies a way of writing a Hamiltonian, a way of writing a Hamiltonian that says there's a bunch of operators that act individually on each factor. There's a bunch of operators that act on pairs of factors, a bunch of operators that act on triplets of factors and so on, okay? Now, in general, if you divided up Hilbert space in this way and had an arbitrary Hamiltonian, this series expansion would never end. There would be, for any two uh, factors of Hilbert space, there would be an operator that gave you the interaction between them. And for any higher order collection of factors, there would be an operator that interacts between them. But in a local theory, which is a very, very tiny subset of all possible theories, interactions are only between nearest neighbors. They're not direct interactions between what happens here and what happens over there. So there's this very nice paper written recently by Cotler, Pennington, and Renard, which actually showed that once you give me the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, it determines what you mean by locality in the following sense, that if you're looking for ways to factorize Hilbert space, then in a generic Hamiltonian, there's no way to factorize Hilbert space so that the Hamiltonian looks local. When there is, even better, when there is a way to factorize Hilbert space so the Hamiltonian looks local, that way is more or less unique. 
There's not many, many different ways to take the same quantum theory and think of it as different local theories, okay? There's basically the right way to think of things as fundamentally local. There's footnotes and caveats there too. You might know about ADS CFT, which is an obvious one, but they can be dealt with. And the, the, the result is basically, there's still a very, very small number of ways that you could define things to be looking local. So what that means is that not only do we have this factorization of Hilbert space into what corresponds to local regions of space, but we have a graph structure on that factorization. We have a way of drawing edges between two factors of Hilbert space based on do they interact directly with each other or not, okay? So this defines a topology on the space of all these little tiny nodes in Hilbert space, all these different subfactors of Hilbert space. And that topology gives us what we mean by locality. It tells us whether two things are next to each other or not. And this is a fairly carefully established mathematical result. So I think it's just true that locality in the sense that we know and love it can be derived just from the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. But we want more than that. We're more ambitious than that. So we're gonna move off of mathematically rigorous results into some more hand wavy parts. We want not just a topology, but a geometry on space time. And you can't get that just from the Hamiltonian because the Hamiltonian is fixed once and for all. Whereas what we want is a geometry of space-time that is dynamical and can change. So we're gonna to have to think harder about it. So the answer is, the short answer is, the Hamiltonian is there once and for all, but we, what we want to do is consider a state, a vector in Hilbert space expressed in this factorization and let that state change over time. And so it's the state, not the Hamiltonian, that will have to define what we mean by the geometry of space-time. So what does that mean? What is the information contained in a quantum state that we can use to derive the geometry? The answer is how much entanglement there is between different factors. So what we're considering here is the possibility that the entanglement of the quantum state defines the geometry of space-time. And I need to say that is a little bit different than what you usually hear. There are many, many um, people working very hard on this question of can entanglement define the geometry of space-time, but they're doing it in a very different context. They're doing it in this ADS-CFT context. Probably you've heard about this, but the general idea, you have a D-dimensional space-time that has gravity in it, that has anti de Sitter boundary conditions, and a D minus one dimensional space-time that is flat space-time without gravity, which is just a conformal field theory, okay? And back in the 1990s, Juan Maldesena said under the right conditions, these two theories are secretly exactly the same. There's a backwards and forwards map between this field theory in D minus one dimensions and this gravity theory in D dimensions. It's a non-local relationship between what's going on, but it's, it's been checked many, many times. So what people are doing following Swingle and Van Ramstonk and others is looking at how entanglement in the field theory side of things defines geometry in the bulk, in the ADS side of things. And that's a fascinating thing to do. It's very, very important. It's not what I'm doing, okay? I'm not in ADS. I'm not assuming any boundary conditions. I'm still a physicist who likes to live in the real world where apples fall from trees and the moon goes around the earth. And we can't rely on a negative cosmological constant because there isn't a negative cosmological constant. That's what you need for anti de Sitter space. My impression is the cosmological constant is a positive number. So I wanna be able to do as much as we can in the bulk directly here in this room or in the solar system where we can probe what's going on with gravity. So that's in some sense much easier. You don't have all these uh, ADS boundary effects. But on the other hand, it's harder because the theory is much less well-defined. We'll have to do a lot more hand-waving. But what we can do is take some knowledge, some wisdom that we're given by quantum field theory. So in a quantum field theory, things are happening in empty space, okay? You might be told that two particles can be entangled no matter how far away they are. That's true. But in quantum field theory, there are modes in the vacuum. In empty space, there are quantum field theory modes, and they have a very specific entanglement structure. The nearby modes are highly entangled. The faraway modes are very unentangled, roughly speaking. So what we're going to do is to turn that around. Rather than calculating entanglement as a function of distance, we're going to say maybe what you mean by distance is related to the entanglement between two different regions of space. And we know how to quantify that. I'm going to zoom through this slide. But John von Neumann, again, years ago, told us that if you have systems in quantum theories, subsystems that are entangled, you can calculate the entropy 
of subsystems. And that tells us how much that one subsystem is entangled with the rest of the world. What we wanna know is how entangled two subsystems are with each other, which you can characterize by something called the mutual information between those subsystems. If you're a particle physicist or a field theorist in the audience, you can think about the two point function between two subsystems, between two different regions of space. There's a very direct relationship. The mutual information uh, is always greater than or equal to a properly normalized two point function for the quantum theory you have in mind. So given these two subsystems, P and Q, I can calculate just from the wave function of the universe, how entangled they are. That's the mutual information. And then we will conjecture that what you mean by distance is a metric on this graph that we drew, which is approximately minus the logarithm of the mutual information. So the more entangled you are, the further, sorry, the more, yeah, the more entangled you are, the closer you are, the smaller the distance is. Small entanglement, large distance, large entanglement, small distance. And we've checked in a couple of numerical cases where you know what the entanglement is, that this does indeed allow you to answer this question. If someone just hands you the list of the, the quantum state, you tell me what it is actually describing. This is a one dimensional quantum state and it, we found that it looks one dimensional. This is a two dimensional system that we found that looks two dimensional, okay. So if you buy all these conjectures that I've been throwing at you, we have something that is very clear. There is a relationship between geometry and entanglement. That's, well, maybe that's not super clear. That's our conjecture. The clear thing is there's a relationship between entanglement and entropy. That's what von Neumann gave us years ago. What would really be nice is that there were also a relationship between entropy and energy, because we know that gravity is described by Einstein as a relationship between the geometry of space-time and energy. So if we can go through this list of relationships, we would relate geometry to energy via entanglement. And of course, if you were an old school 19th century thermodynamicist, it would be obvious to you that entropy and energy are related. Entropy is the integral of the heat transfer divided by the temperature, okay? This is still true in our high powered quantum mechanical world. There's something called the entanglement first law, which relates changes in the entropy of a quantum system to changes in something called the modular Hamiltonian. This is the point of the talk where I'm just using buzzwords and not defining them. There's no time to go into details about this. Read the papers, all the details are there. But I, let me tell you the, the sort of upshot, the, the sort of intuitive idea behind it. If you're in the vacuum state, you know there's a certain entanglement structure between all of these different things. If you want to decrease the amount of entanglement between two nearby regions, that means changing the state, and that means increasing the energy of the state, because you started in the vacuum state. There's nowhere to go but up with the energy. So there's clearly and immediately a relationship between entanglement and the energy in that region of space. Therefore, by our previous conjectures, there's a relationship between the geometry and the energy. And here's the wonderful thing. You can derive an equation for the relationship between geometry and energy. And it's an old fashioned, very well-known equation that was invented by Einstein. So this is this sort of overly technical uh, plot here, the schematic diagram comes from ideas that Ted Jacobson has been describing for years now. What Jacobson did was start with space time calculate entropy within regions of space-time, and by imagining that entropy has a certain equation of state, he could derive Einstein's equation. We're just going one step further by not even starting with space-time, by just starting with the quantum state and saying you can derive the space-time and then do that procedure. So if you start with the big buy here at the top, that there's a relationship between changes in entropy, perturbative changes in entropy, and perturbative changes in the emergent geometry of space, by this procedure on right and left sides, you derive Einstein's equation. Now, it's not a cut and dried derivation that would make anyone happy, neither mathematician or physicist. What it is, in the most recent paper I wrote with Charles Tsao about this, what we did is we listed a bunch of assumptions that need to be true in order to make this derivation work. We can't prove all these assumptions are true, but they're all perfectly reasonable. So it's basically full employment for graduate students uh, in the audience. There's plenty of things to be proven to make this theory uh, make this approach come true. But the idea of the approach is extremely attractive and I hope you can see why. The idea is, let me just tell you what the idea is. Here's the last slide because I'm running out of time. Here's the overall idea just to run it by you. We start with a quantum theory and we start by not cheating, okay? So when I say we start by a quantum theory, someone tells you how big Hilbert space is, 
when someone tells you what the Hamiltonian is, i.e. what the, all the energy eigenvalues, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. We can then learn how to carve up Hilbert space by demanding things like, well, we want classical behavior for subsystems within Hilbert space, like cats and planets and things like that. And then we can go slightly beyond uh, classical behavior to locality and geometry by looking at the locality of interactions and the entanglement between different regions of space, okay? So we define an emergent geometry in the classical limit from the quantum state by attributing a distance to a measure that depends on the entanglement between different regions. And then what we argue is that under very reasonable assumptions, that geometry naturally obeys Einstein's equation for general relativity. The fact that it's Einstein's equation is not that surprising. I mean, what else could it be? The interesting thing is not that it's that particular equation, but that it obeys an equation. That, you know, if you take this philosophy seriously, that what you and I know of as space-time is not fundamental, but it emerges from features of the quantum state, then of course the geometry of space-time is going to be dynamical because the quantum state is dynamical, right? So uh, it's very, very natural that space-time should have a life of its own, just like Einstein taught us over a hundred years ago. So let me be super clear. There's, I, I hope I was clear during the talk, there are many loose ends, many leaps of faith, many conjectures, many things that could go wrong with this program. Certainly, as I said over and over again, some of the things we want to be true in this kind of approach are not true for generic Hamiltonians. We're not claiming that any Hamiltonian would give rise to a smooth space-time, three dimensions and things like that. So clearly there are special features of the Hamiltonian and it may very well be that those special features can be summarized as saying it's the Hamiltonian of string theory or something like that. But I think that taking first this quantum mechanical view that you start with states in Hilbert space, start with the Schrodinger equation and derive everything from that that should be applicable no matter what you think the Hamiltonian is. So I think this is hopefully a very useful way going forward to think about what space-time is and where it comes from. Thank you very much. Thank you for this excellent talk. Uh, if you enjoyed it on YouTube, please say something in the YouTube chat. If you enjoyed it in the Zoom session, please write something in the Zoom chat. I'll share the Zoom chat transcript with private chats redacted uh, with Professor Carroll after the talk. So uh, he'll be able to see all of the appreciation. So thank you very much. That was a really nice talk. And now we have time for about 10 minutes of questions. Uh, and I'm going to start with a question in the Zoom session right away, if that's OK. Uh, uh, Professor Robert Brandenberger, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Robert, are you able to unmute yourself? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. That's my fault. I forgot to, have to do it. allow unmute. OK, now I can ask the question. Yeah, sorry about that point midway through your talk I was going to ask what the what time is because you had the Schrodinger equation written down but I guess you never use it all you use later on is the Hilbert space you never actually use the Schrodinger equation is that right well um I use the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian so implicitly uh I'm using the Schrodinger equation but you know baby steps here for me time is a parameter in the Schrodinger equation. That's what it is. Uh, it's fundamental. It's part of the definition of the theory. Space is not. So I am treating space and time on a very asymmetric footing. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that in the infrared limit, we'll get things back like Lorentz invariance, general coordinate invariance, etc. So that's part of the big program of lots of work to do. But interestingly, that might mean that there are experimental consequences of this approach in things like violations of Lorentz invariance. If Lorentz invariance is only a good approximation. It's also possible that time is just as emergent as space. That approach has its own issues that I didn't want to get into in this talk. But so today for me, time is just a fundamental parameter. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll go to one from YouTube and I'll just uh, pick one off here. So uh, there was an interesting one you can't hear the shape of a drum. A being made of drum quanta could construct all observables from the spectrum, but stay ignorant of something fundamental. Does this bother you? There are very few things that bother me about what we can't do uh, in physics. You know, I think that we are gonna ask what it is that we can do. So um, many steps along the way in a project like this, a program like this, 
we are faced with things that we would like to be able to determine uniquely from the data we're given, um, but we don't either we can't or we don't yet know how. And I think that you know this is part bug, part feature. I mean, part of it might be that we're missing some important ingredients that we need to add to this very simple recipe that we start with. Part of it might be that we're just not yet clever enough to figure out how to answer these questions. I know that these are very vague statements, but um, you know things like the definition of locality, uh, uh, Cutler et al. proved that it's almost unique, but not perfectly unique. And so is that important? Is that a big deal? You know, this is a, a big feature of dualities in quantum field theory, that you can have two very different classical descriptions that give you the same quantum theory. And then which one is the right classical limit? I think there are answers to these questions, but I think they're not obvious and we have to think harder about how to find them. Okay, thank you. Uh, now the next question will come from Zoom. Uh, Daniele Michili, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yes, um, I was interested to have in more information about these issues remaining to uh, pursue your aspirational program. Well, yeah, as I, as I sort of just alluded to, um, we have a list of assumptions you can find in my paper with Charles Sal from a couple of years ago. One of the big ones is if you go back um, to the bottom of this graph here, where we say, we assume Lorentz invariance is true. <laughs> so there's a theorem, a very basic mathematical theorem that if you have a finite dimensional vector space, you cannot represent the action of a non-compact symmetry group on that space. That's an absolutely true theorem that would seem to imply that Lorentz symmetry or Poincaré symmetry, which are non-compact symmetry groups, cannot be exactly represented in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, so there should be, at some level, violations of Lorentz invariance in this theory. But the theorem doesn't tell you how those violations get experimentally manifested, right? Um, but I think that there's a lot of work yet, yet to do here. So showing whether Lorentz invariance comes true is a good one. Showing why the matter fields look like quantum field theory, like what well, the matter degrees of freedom, or even just in more generality, uh, the differentiation of degrees of freedom into space, time, and matter. Okay, Jake's, Jacobson talks a little bit about this in the ADS-CFT correspondence game. Uh, people are increasingly intrigued by the idea that quantum error correction might have something to do with it. And I think in this bulk approach, it's less obvious. So there's lots of work to do there. Finally, you know, we, we've really, this particular plot that I'm showing here or, or, or schematic only works currently in the weak field limit of gravity. Um, one of the reasons why my program is such a minority pursuit is that everyone else is in ADS where the curvature of space-time is crucially important, right? The cosmological horizon is, is crucially important, or they care about black holes where black holes are crucially important. And those are precisely the contexts where gravity looks non-local, right? Where the non-locality is crucially important. So I think that adding non-locality and holography and complementarity to this approach is another big uh, thing to do in the future. I mean, I would love to say, don't do them because I'm going to do them all, but I'm, <laughs> I would be very happy if someone else did them and then, and then you know, cited our papers. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll go back to a YouTube question. Uh, so there's a question from YouTube. Can we still split up parts of the Hamiltonian if we naively think of it as a list of energies for a set of states? Seems like splitting relies on nice algebraic form. Not sure. Oh, no, I think that it's pretty automatic. What the splitting relies on is the factorization of Hilbert space. So once you factorize Hilbert space, then the Hamiltonian just gets decomposed that way. That's just automatic. Um, how to factorize Hilbert space for different reasons is the tricky thing, you know, what you consider to be subsystems. But I think that, you know, Ashmi and I in our, in our paper just this year gave a, a very solid first step to answering that question and you know looking at it in more general context should be doable even if it's not been done yet okay great uh and i guess we'll go back to zoom for the next question so pranjapi manu could you please unmute yourself and ask your question turn on your video if you like okay uh thank you for a very nice talk um my question was at the beginning you started out with you could do an ultraviolet cutoff and an infrared cutoff and have a sort of finite number of modes but then you could populate each mode arbitrarily high 
and gravity won't have it, right? You will form a black hole. But now, how? where does the difference bosons and fermions come in? Because if you had fermions, you could not do that last step. Yeah, you're completely right. I was talking about bosons. <laughs> you caught me. I think that you know bosons are the, the context in which uh, the simple relationship between free field modes and the harmonic oscillator works most clearly. You don't, you don't get that for fermions, but there are bosons in the world. So I think what I was saying before still is true. Okay. But do you have a way of uh, introducing fermion, I mean, statistics into your... Well, I think, look, we don't have a way of introducing fields into our uh, formalism just yet. Um, if anything, from this perspective, fermions should be easier. They're kind of more naturally discrete, right? And we have a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So um, I don't think it will be, uh, I don't see any looming ob obstacles to do that. So the big obstacle is just derive field theory in the infrared limit. I'm, hap I'm, I'm sort of convinced it will happen if you have Lorentz invariant dynamics. There are theorems from Weinberg and other people to this effect that anything looks like a quantum field theory at long enough wavelengths if it's relativistic and local. Um, but the specific way in that which that happens, I, I'm completely ignorant about right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, so I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to leave it to one more question. Uh, sorry to all of you who've asked very, very good questions on YouTube and in Zoom uh, who want to ask questions still but won't be able to because time is just short. So the last question uh, is, what sets the limit for what counts as an interaction that causes decoherence and one that doesn't? Can oh, you, uh, you know, decoherence is a continuum. It's not a sharp thing. Um, this is a foundations of quantum mechanics question, not anything to do with specifically what I've been talking about today, but it, it, it's a feature of decoherence. So let me just back up for those of you who are not experts. Think of decoherence as a system, a quantum mechanical system that is in a superposition of states becoming entangled with the environment. Okay, so first you'd need to have a definition of what's the system and what's the environment. Let's assume that you have that. And it's a feature of quantum dynamics that there are some systems that you can shield from becoming entangled. It shouldn't be surprising when you think about it. I mean, you know that a single spin that is, let's say, spin up in the Z direction. Well, that's also describable as a superposition of spin left and spin right in the X direction. So you can think of it either as a single state or as a superposition of two states. So th there can't be any rule that superpositions automatically decohere because whether or not you're in a superposition is a basis dependent statement, okay? So anyway, there are physical situations in which systems don't get entangled. If you have an electron in an atom, it'll just sit there. It won't become entangled with the world around it unless it's hit by a photon, which is a rare event. Um, but once, systems start interacting with the environment, the environment has so many degrees of freedom in it that is generally true that decoherence happens in a snap, okay? Time scales for macroscopic objects, if you take a, a cubic centimeter of ordinary stuff at room temperature, uh, if it decoheres at all, it's gonna decohere in less than a zeptosecond, right? Less than the lifetime of a Higgs boson. And therefore, in the real world, uh, when decoherence happens, it either doesn't happen or it happens almost instantaneously. So of course, now that technology is forcing us into regions where we're trying to build quantum computers and have dozens or hundreds of entangled coherent qubits, we're trying to stop decoherence, even though it's super duper effective. And that's the big technological challenge. So in that regime, you really do start worrying about, you know, one bit's worth of entanglement or something like that. So there's no, so for big macroscopic things, for everything that was relevant before we invented quantum computing technology, decoherence was either on or off. But these days we do need to worry about the extent to which things become decohered and can you error correct them back? Thank you very much. Uh, so thanks once again for an excellent talk. Uh, if you really enjoyed the talk and you haven't already said so, please write something into the chat in Zoom, or if you're watching on YouTube, some, write something in the chat in YouTube. I'm sure Professor Carroll will appreciate seeing all of your appreciation afterward. So this concludes this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. Before we end this live stream, I would like to just remind everyone with a tenured or tenure track, without a tenured or tenure track position in the Zoom session that you're welcome to join the Apple Colloque. Uh, please also join us next week uh, for the Physical Society Colloquium, which will be given by Professor Tanya Tajmel from uh, Concordia University, entitled Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Beyond Policy.
Thanks once again to all who have joined, who have joined us. Uh, good evening, a bonne soirée.